And good morning. Today, as we get ready to start, get started, I'm preaching a sermon called Take Up Your Cross and Follow Me, obviously from our scripture today, um, from Mark uh, chapter 8, verses 27 through 39 or 38. And so what we want to do today is um, as we get ready to preach a sermon, what I'd like for you to do is to um, open up your Bibles and or your bulletins uh, to this passage so that you can take some notes and do those kinds of things that might be helpful to you. There's some pens in the pews and some other things like that. I want to begin today's sermon by uh, read, letting you know a piece of Scripture that I think falls very much in line with this passage uh, today from Mark, uh, as Jesus is with his disciples in Caesarea Philippi. And I want to give this passage to you today and let you kind of hold on to it. It's from Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. And it might be one of those things that, that you might just want to kind of uh, incorporate into your own hearts so that you can begin uh, to follow the Lord in a way that might even be more fruitful than you are uh, at current. Isaiah says this, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor my ways, nor your ways, my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We all know that piece of scripture or it's somewhere in our lives. But yet there is the crux of the matter, the cross of the matter, that we all too often want to go off and do our own thing and not the thoughts and devices and desires of God. And so I kind of hold that out for you today. I've got it memorized in a different translation in my own head. But you might want to put that into your life that your, my thoughts, the Lord's thoughts, are not your thoughts nor my ways, or your ways, my ways, says the Lord. For the heavens are higher than the earth, and so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts more than your thoughts. So today what we're going to do is we're going to see Jesus at Caesarea Philippi as we look at Mark chapter 8. And we're going to see him in these villages, and he's going to be there. And as he's there, the big question comes up, who do people say that I am? And the response of the disciples is something that we're aware of, and it says, John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others say one of the prophets. And in our world today, many of the world are saying, who is this Jesus? And they're not really sure if he's a, a moral teacher or if he is uh, someone in the lines of John the Baptist, is he's a prophet, who he is. And quite honestly, even in the church today, we get confused. People get wondering in their hearts, who is this Christ? Is he the Son of God? Is he the Messiah? Or is he just a good moral teacher and leader? And so we're going to see from this passage and in this church and the way that we live that he is the Messiah. He is the Christ, as Peter is going to say there in that place of Caesarea Philippi. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer. Now, this is not quite something that you and I want to see or that they wanted to see as they looked at Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah. They did not want to see him suffer. They wanted to be exalted. They wanted to see him high and lifted up. But he's teaching them something that they don't want to hear. What is Jesus teaching you today that you don't want to hear? And that you may not want to follow, because I'll guarantee he's teaching today, and he's speaking today. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after the third day rise again. So what is Jesus teaching you today? What is a hard lesson that he is teaching you today? And Peter and his impetuous little self is going to say, no, you can't have these things happen. And very often in our lives, we also say, no, Jesus, you can't do that with me or my money or anything else. You can't do that. And Jesus says, oh, yes, I can. 
So he rebukes Peter and says, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on things of God, but you're setting your mind on the things of man. You're living careful, Peter, and I want you to live on the edge, Peter. And maybe he's calling you and I today to live further on the edge for his purpose and his glory and his great love. And he says this, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. So we've got these teachings going on here, and the Lord is convicting you somewhere in your heart right this minute of what that cross is in your own life and how you must take it up and follow him and and what that's going to mean in your own life. But I do want you to understand that our human nature, dear friends, wants to be prosperous, strong, and successful and influential, but Jesus has other priorities. He, on the other hand, came to serve and not be served. His ways are not our ways, and he invites us to follow him in his ways. So there's an interesting thing that's going on. Our human nature want one thing. Christ wants another thing. So there's going to have to be something that goes on in our lives that is going to have to go by the wayside. And that is the concept that I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to give you two things that we need to focus on today. One is self-denial. The other is taking up your cross. So as we look at this, we're going to take a look at self-denial. None of us like it. None of us are excited about it. But Jesus is. So maybe we ought to move over to his thoughts and his ways and learn something about self-denial and what that means. The self of which Jesus is speaking is rather the natural, sinful, rebellious, unredeemed self that's at the center of every fallen person. And that it can be reclaimed only and can even reclaim temporary control over a Christian. You and I in our own lives have that fallen nature within us. We are redeemed by cross, Christ on the cross. We are saved by his grace. But yet, temporarily, with any instant, that unredeemed state can be taken over, or that redeemed state can be taken over by the unredeemed state. And we are utterly out of control in that moment. To be a part of self-denial means to utterly separate oneself from someone. And that would be from us. Separating ourselves from ourself and living a different reality. And Paul said it this way in Romans chapter 7, verse 18. He said this, I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I hate to break it to you, but nothing good dwells within me in my flesh. And something has to happen where there's a separation between my flesh and me and possibly yourselves. I hate to break it to you, but there's nothing good that dwells within your flesh. And that doesn't feel very good, does it? So we all think more highly of ourselves than we ought, don't we? We always think there's more potential in our humanity than there actually is. And we continue to see people fall and and ourselves fall when we think more highly of ourselves and we think that we can do it. The truth of the matter is there is no good 
within me. And I don't want to beat you up today, but there's no good within you either. Now that everyone wants to leave, <laughs> say, what's going on here? We came here to feel good. We came here to feel uplifted, that we're good people, and that we're loved, and that we're adored, and you are. But it's not my job to convince you of that. When you and I see ourselves as we are, as wretched as we are, as sinful as we are, then we know something of the love of God because when we see ourselves that way, then we can say, but you loved me in that horrible place of my own wretchedness? You loved me when I was ugly and when I'm ugly. And then you and I all of a sudden begin to understand something of mercy. Something of God's mercy that but when we were a sinner and when we are a sinner far away from the Lord, but God loves you. See, the problem in today's world and in many churches is the fact that we accept the all-loving, encompassing God, love of God, but we forget what he saw us as, as a stranger running far away from him. That's our reality. That's who we are. But yet when we were in sin, God reached out to you and I. And that, my dear friends, is amazing grace. I would really like to tell you how great you are, people. But don't listen to me. Listen to God, who sought you when a stranger who sees your inmost thoughts and desires and but yet still loves you. Self-denial is placing and understanding as Arthur Pink wrote, theologian and preacher, that growth in grace is a growth downward it is the forming of a lower estimate of ourselves. It is a deepening realization of our nothingness. It is a heartfelt recognition that we are not worthy of the least of God's mercies. But God dared to enter the world and go to a cross and die for you and I, that we might have everlasting life, and that we might live a life of grace right now. So who still wants to leave? I can tell you in my own personal life that as I have gained a more full understanding of who I really am, and what God has truly done for me, I can then look at the cross and say thank you. But if I try to fool myself, I look at the cross and I go, wow, that was nice. So self-denial is one of the keys. The next is taking up your cross. And dear friends in Christ, I want you to know that taking up your cross is not having a difficult husband. That would be far too easy. 
for a difficult wife or an unsaved husband or an unsaved wife or having some kind of physical disability. That's not taking up your cross. That's life. And God teaches us in how to live life in those difficult situations because he sends your Holy Spirit to you, his Holy Spirit to you, so that he can empower and equip us to deal with those troublesome situations. That's not taking up your cross. That's an easy out. To take up your cross is simply to be willing to pay any price for Christ's sake. To pay any price for Christ's sake. So what is that going to mean in your life and in my life? What's it going to mean for you to pay any price for Christ's sake? So we begin to look at this issue of taking up our cross. We want to turn to Caesarea Philippi, the place where this proclamation was. And this proclamation was in a place where it was a city that had been the center of Baal worship or evil worship. It had been a place where the Greek god Panis had been uh, erected an altar. So you've got two altars there. You've got Baal worship going on there in the past. And then you have Panis, which is the, the Greek god, which is being worshipped there. And then later on, it's set up as a temple to Caesar Augustus. And so you've got three gods that are being worshipped in this one place. And Jesus arrives, and he is called the Christ. Messiah, the Son of God. And in that place where there are many different idols, Christ is proclaimed as the Messiah. Now, here you go. You and I have a number of different idols, different things that we worship. In our own lives, there are a number of things out there that are idolatrous. There are things that we worship, that things become much more important than the Messiah. And they're in your house. They're all over the place. It may be your bank account, your 401K. It could be a number of different things that are out there that are much more important than Christ. And we elevate them to a place of worship. But in this place, like your household, where there are these idols, Christ is proclaimed as the Messiah. And he tells them to take up their cross and follow him. And so you need to understand something of the image of the things that are going on in these disciples' heads as they're there. You need to realize that a hundred men have been crucified in that area recently. So the disciples are going, take up your cross and follow me. Do you mean I'm going to be crucified right here, right now, in front of all of this? Take up your cross and follow me. What is that going to mean? A century earlier, Alexander Janus had crucified 800 Jewish uh, rebels in Jerusalem. Take up your cross and follow me. Am I going to die Revolt that followed the death of Herod the Great. 2,000 Jews were crucified by the Roman proconsul Varius. Take up your cross and follow me? What do you mean? Cross is a symbol of torture. And death. And they pictured at that moment a poor soul, possibly their own, with the crossbar on their shoulders, carrying it to their impending death. Dear friends in Christ, take up your cross and follow me is to begin a death march. Your own 
death march. Are you willing? Take up your cross and follow me means to suffer the indignities, the pain, and even the death of a condemned criminal. Take up your cross means to deny yourself basically means to relinquish all your claims to life and let Christ run it. So as a Christian, taking up your cross and follow me means that you do not even belong to yourself. Now that, my dear friends, is harder than any tithing sermon you will ever hear. Christ demands us to give it all up for his sake and take up the cross and for whatever it may mean, follow him. So in your mind today, you might think of those Christians that were on a beach that all had their heads cut off today. Take up your cross and follow me. In your own minds, in your own Caesarea Philippi today, we just remembered 9-11 where thousands of people were killed. Take up your cross and follow me. Self-denial is a fairly easy concept when you put it in context with taking up your cross and follow me. You know, all of us tend to have pretty crosses around our necks or jewelry or um, uh, in our homes. We have a cross somewhere around that we look at, and, and it is pretty. And I have, I have hundreds of crosses. And I look at those crosses, and I realize that in order to take up my cross and follow Christ, I'm going to have to give up everything. Oh, they're very, very pretty, but they're far from beautiful. On September the 14th, Monday, is Holy Cross Day. It's a day that the church remembers the cross. And many people around the world will come to their churches and they will bring crosses and they will place them around the altar and they will ask the priest to bless those crosses. And we might do that someday here. But the idea is, is that we remember the symbol and the power of the cross. In 335, Emperor Constantine at the... Uh, bequest of his mother, built a basilica in Jerusalem, which was over the site of the crucifixion in Christ's tomb, shrine of the Holy Sepulchre, houses what would be a fragment of the cross of Christ, of which the King of Glory died. On Holy Cross Day, we say a prayer that says something like this, Almighty God, whose blessed, beloved Son was willing to endure the agony and shame of the cross for our redemption, give us courage to take up our cross and follow Him who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Are you and I willing to take up our cross and follow him. In 1988, I made a decision in my life that I would ask my wife for a cross. My wife bought me a cross. We shopped a long time for it, and I found exactly the one I wanted. And I wear it all the time. 
That cross is a beautiful cross, but it's not a cross of beauty for me. It's a cross that reminds me that daily I must die unto myself. I must live a life of self-denial. It's a cross that says to me that, in fact, I have lost all control of my own life, and it is only Christ who can live within me. And you want to know the truth? When I have a hard time remembering that, which is often, I take that cross and I hold it. And I hold it dearly. And I say, Lord Jesus, remember Remind me today of who I am and who you are. The wretchedness of who I am so that I can know the glory of who you are and what you have done for me. Many a night have I held that cross. What cross do you hold? What cross adorns you? And are you and I willing to die and take up our cross and follow Christ? Dear friends in Christ, for those who lose their life for my sake will gain it. Amen.